and welcome to the Mindset Michelle TV show. It's so exciting to have you joining us for yet another fabulous, fabulous show where today I have the extra special guest, Dr. Dion Payne. Hello, Dion. Hello, Michelle. How are you? I'm great, thank you. It's so wonderful to have you on the show today. And for those of you that aren't aware of Dr. Dion Payne, she's the founder and CEO of High Impact Property Investments and she specialises in raising capital for organisations that create ethical property developments. Now, this sounds truly, truly incredible and enough on its own, but she's also an award-winning author and speaker and a property coach. So, so many different areas there, Dion, and I'd love to start unpacking and, and hearing from you a little bit more about your background and how did you come to be involved in ethical property investment? Well, it's a it's a bit of a long story and a bit of a uh, sort of you know windy route. Um, I actually started uh, as a chemist, as a um, a pharmaceutical chemist. That's what I did my my uh, undergraduate degree in, and I worked for pharmaceutical companies. And over time, I, I really enjoyed what it was that I did. I, I enjoyed the science and the research aspect of it. Um, but I wanted to move more towards natural products. So my nan was, I was going to say a healer. I, I don't necessarily know that she would have called herself that, uh, but she had a way with herbs. And, and you know, I just remember growing up with really disgusting concoctions <laughs> that for whatever reason, they seemed to work. And, and so maybe that was part of my DNA. And that led me to Australia to study a PhD in sugarcane chemistry. So I was looking at sugarcane as a source of medicines for diabetes, which sounds very counterintuitive. Um, but really what it came down to was that if you don't refine sugar in the first place, sugarcane has all of the necessary nutrients and phytochemicals that are health, uh, health promoting. Uh, but when you strip them away, which is what happens in the refi refining process, um, then you've just left with the sugar and that's what causes the issue. So that was great. I loved my research. I loved uh, getting up every day and, and going and playing in the laboratory. Um, but it came to the point where I realised that what I thought academia was, it, it wasn't. It was what I thought academia was, was waking up and, you know, sort of reading research papers and doing really exciting research. And, and what I discovered was that actually it's very competitive and you're always on the lookout for grants and there were no even if you thought that you had a long-term contract that wasn't really the case it was very short-term work so I didn't really want that level of job insecurity so <coughs> children instead <laughs> and... <laughs> a different kind of insecurity hey <laughs> well yeah and it's interesting because it was a bit of an insecure time I mean I loved it and I wanted to stay home with my kids and, and I had the best time and you know having having kids after doing a PhD that felt like holiday like rather than the <laughs> level of work that I was doing but um what I discovered was that the insecurity that I felt as a new mother staying home looking after kids was that one of not being able to find a property that was affordable for us to live in on one income something that was affordable for us to buy on one income so we have this great Australian dream of, of owning a property and it just seemed really out of reach at that stage so that led me and my husband to look at property development courses and and really find out about if we could understand the game of property then would that give us a, a leg up when it came to finding our own home now that I told you it was winded didn't I um, <laughs> that led me to um we did a couple of small developments and and that was good it, you know it made sense that we did some renovations we did some subdivisions uh, therefore yes we, we made money that way um, but then that all changed for me when I found a piece of land that had development approval for 14 one bedroom townhouses. Um, and at first I looked at it and thought, well, you know, we're going to make a lot of money out of this. This is going to be really great. But then when I had friends contacting me saying, well, this is something that's affordable for us and, and we'd love to live here. And, and those friends actually buying into that development. And um, I got to realize that actually there was something much beyond just the financial reward. Um, and, and it was a really challenging project as well in lots of ways. But what kept me going was the fact that I felt I felt I had a duty to um, the people that had invested in it in terms of the people that were buying uh, those units. So 
you know despite all the challenges we kept going and, and now every time I walk past it I think well you know that's really great that we did that and for me the the real the the thing that was life-changing actually was the fact that I recognized that not only could I make money but I could also do something that had a benefit for something bigger than just me and 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 making that leap it, it wasn't it wasn't that it was really apparent at that stage I'm, I'm really talking from the benefit of hindsight now but that really was the moment where I just went okay well if that's the case then this way of doing property development should be the norm and not the exception Wow, what a fascinating and interesting story, all the way from sugarcane to um, property development and a very windy road in between of having children and PhDs. <laughs> um, lots and lots of, um, I'm hearing lots of achievement and lots of incredible journey there. I also think um, you, you said it so beautifully at the end there where you, you came to that realisation that it didn't have to be one or the other, you could actually be doing both earning a living and making a bit of profit as well as supporting and, and doing good in the world. I, I think that, you know, with your um, interesting perspective, you know, as somebody that did come to Australia as an adult, um, has studied to a PhD level, which is a very high level as an academic, and also been a successful entrepreneur now, you, you must have a very different insight into well what does success then mean for you mm. that's a good question do you know actually I, I think about it in terms of well what's the outcome so you know when you when you work for somebody you work in a job you, you get paid a salary and you do your job but it, it's that you know you're getting paid for being there and sometimes and I'm not saying this is the whole case I, I better speak for myself I know that as an employee um it's not the, the buck doesn't really stop with me it stops with the the employer um so you know in, in that sense there's a little bit of coasting and if I don't hit that target then it's okay um whereas as uh, you know sort of as somebody in this field if it doesn't work then the buck stops with me so I, I have to be ultimately responsible and then it's not just it's not just me it's the people that I work with and it's their families and and so that sense of responsibility is is really important and there's been times in that journey that I haven't taken that sense of responsibility um very seriously um but as I've got older it, it's recognizing well it's not it's not just me that I'm looking after um, so that's that's a really key thing. And then it comes down to well, what what are the outcomes that I want to actually achieve? Um, and actually, even beyond that, it's what are, what do I want for my kids? What do I want for future generations? I have as a young girl, I had this dream that, you know, I'd get married and, you know, my, my husband and I would be sitting in rocking chairs at the age of 90 with grandchildren surrounding us. And there's still part of me that wants that, you know, like and. And so with what's happening in the world right now and, and the climate crisis and the affordable housing crisis, and I think, well, if we don't sort this out, we, we won't have a planet to live on. I mean, the, the planet will still be here, we won't be, um, and, and we won't have that future that I envisage. So my idea of success is doing whatever I can to, to make that a reality. So take it from here to actually something that I'm living. Wow, what a profound and very insightful um, way of looking at success. And also, again, I love that realisation that you've come to as you've got older, that perhaps the ideal that you grew up with, well, this is what success will look like when I'm old and we've got the grandchildren and the cat and the dog kind of running around in the yard as I sit here on the porch whiling away my days. Um, that the reality now is that, you know, you could be looking at the fires, the floods, the, the pandemics, the whatever it is that are happening outside of the porch and going, well, actually um, that vision of the future is something that you have to, in a sense, take a much more active part today in mm -hmm. to ensure that humanity, and you, you rightly identified the planet will be here, but whether humanity is here is the question that we're kind of <laughs> facing at the moment. So this is still quite a um, uh, um, saving the planet kind of level of the conversation. <laughs> but if we bring it back down to 
what sort of suggestions you might have with those, you know, academic, entrepreneur, mother, all of these different lenses that you view the world through. What sort of suggestions do you have then for how people can create their own, their own kind of aha moments about, well, it's not one or the other, I can actually do both and, and be successful by being both? You asked some really good questions, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, look, I, I, you know, as a society, we've got this collective belief that it is one or the other. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it. That's one of the mantras that we're, we're taught as kids. And actually, I don't think that's true. And it's, it's not just because I've, I've thought of this. I, I've done a lot of uh, personal development work. And I remember... Uh, you know, there's the sort of one one of the courses that I was on, and and we were, yeah, we were just sort of work. You know, so as part of the process, there was a point where I was like, I can't, I can't quite remember the phrase, but along the lines of, I can have it all. Um, and you know, I really questioned that, really questioned that in myself. I can have it all, right? Can I really? I, I can have it. I create it all. That's it. And and so. There's that recognition that we are more powerful than we think we are. And, you know, when we, we can, as humans, I, I don't know if animal species have this ability, but as humans, we can imagine what our future's like. And so through that imagination process, our brains don't know whether that's the truth or not. So it just takes it as being the truth. So when I realized that, I was like, well, I can imagine things into reality um, and it, it I don't know it took me a long time to really get that um, but the way I see it now is that well if if I don't believe that it can happen if I don't believe that I can get there then it's not going to happen anyway so I've not really got anything to lose have I <laughs> <laughs> so I might as well imagine it and, and keep imagining it and but not just imagination it's not just about that it's about taking action to get to where you want as well so I think my my advice for people that you know do do want to have that level of success <coughs> you you know first of all you've got to believe that you can do it and maybe you don't believe that you can do it straight away but you've got to get yourself in a position where you where you do believe that you can do it and there's so much available in terms of personal development and mindset courses and things like that so it's it's not that hard when you actually get into the right environment to do that. And I do remember thinking, how is it that other people have life so easy? Like, what's what's wrong with me? Or what is it that they've got? What's the secret? Um, and then through the personal development work that I've done, it's like, oh, oh, it's 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 one of those secrets that's actually there in plain sight because everybody talks about it. Um, <laughs> but actually, you know, so it, it's them putting it into practice. And I, I think you've hit the nail on the head really well because. You know, there's a whole movie called The Secret. <laughs> there's all of these billion-dollar personal development industries where you can do a course on any aspect of personal development. And, of course, um, of the mindset work that me and the team do as well, we see this with people and, and this, I think you described it very beautifully, this disconnect between kind of processing that, um, whether it's from simple expressions like, you know, um, fake it until you make it where you kind of know well okay if I put all of my focus my energy into what I would, am looking for and what I want then that's where the direction I'm going to go but what we find is that many people in their self-talk so the self-talk that you get from society and you get from many places it keeps you focused on what you don't have you don't have this you don't have that and so that reprogramming which is what this program's about as well to help keep focusing people back onto the program of what they want in their life and self-talk in their life to get to that point because whether we're talking at the planet level or you know we have individual success on the more smaller scale level like we were talking about you could be so focused on the floods, the famines, the droughts, the, the pandemics out there that in many ways you actually can't do anything about. But all your energy goes into watching the news and watching that as opposed to going, well, this is what I want to focus on and create in my life. And so this is where I'm putting my energy into. And, 
in a small way that's what the program started from last year as well was to try and keep bringing people back to well most of this you can't control but you can control your mind your every day in many ways and when you put your energy into that then like you've realized and it's wonderful that you've come to that point you can create whatever you want and then it's just a matter of deciding what you want as well yeah, that's it. And um, I, I had a conversation with a friend recently, and and so there's lots of challenges. They they got caught up in the floods, um, you know, their their house got uh, uh, water ended up in their house. Um, my they're dear friends of mine. They're going through a separation at the moment, and for ages they've been in a little bit of a, a deadlock as to how to resolve it and how to move forwards. Um, so I was saying exactly the same thing. You, you have to decide what it is that you want. What is it that's going to make you happy rather than staying in a situation where you feel stuck? What is it that you want? And you've got to accept that for the other person, it might not be what they want. And that would be a real shame, but you've got to come back to here. You've got to know what you want, what you need, um, and then you can decide from there. But when you're trying to sort of, you know, factor in somebody else, and it, it's just hard. So regardless, you might have the most fantastic relationship in the world. You might not, but you have to still really focus on what it is that you want. And there's a, there's a bit of a perception there that it's selfish to just focus on what you want. I don't think so. Um, I don't I don't think so. And I don't I don't really try to think of how to delineate it. I, I think one of the things that um, uh, I came to on a number of different people and cope and clients that we've coached we've helped to get to this point where for me the, the difference between being selfish and self-centered in a sense yeah. is that when you are doing things for yourself but not against somebody else that's being selfish but if you're doing something and you're doing it but there's still an energy or an element about I'm going to get you by doing this for me and I don't care what you think then that that is like a negative version of being selfish and self-centered because your energy and, and you can't pretend with this stuff. You really mm. do have to work at it. <laughs> if your energy is like, well, I'm choosing to do this because it supports me, not because of anything about you. And, and I think one of the things as we're talking through this topic that um, I'm, I'm aware of and, and some of the writings I was doing today were around people taking that time so one of the things that happens when you're doing a number of different jobs and you've got children and floods and famines and pandemics is that it can feel like your time for you gets smaller and smaller but it's actually the time that you need to create more time for you for exactly like you're describing that those friends of yours need to find the time or make the time to actually have that quiet space to determine what it is they want for themselves. Because otherwise, external factors, whether it's the other person or circumstances, will determine it for them. And then they'll keep finding that they're resentful because it's not what they wanted, but they haven't actually quite reached the point of being able to say clearly to themselves or like anybody else, this is exactly what I want. So that quiet time, and that, that, in a sense, is selfish as well because it's self creating that time to be self-centred and centering in yourself. Um, and I think it's a, it, these are great ways of having these conversations and, and having the conversation where, you know, I might still feel like you're being selfish to do that. And so it's okay to then say, well, I hear you and I appreciate that you feel like I'm being selfish. And, and not to make other people right or wrong, but just acknowledge. And many times, as you will know, a lot of this can just actually be being heard in that communication element, as well as finding the time for the space, having these conversations, and then just actually hearing people and hearing what they're really saying behind the words that they say. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I love how when you talked about being self-centered I've, I've had I've heard people say that to me before I, I went through a bit of a, a, a rough patch um, where, where I, I did do a lot of personal development work to figure out what the hell was wrong with me it turns out there was nothing wrong with me it was just you know <laughs> it's just, you know you sort of have to go through those dark times to really know yourself um, but 
uh, yeah, I've heard self-centered being used in a negative way, but actually I think it's quite important to be centered in yourself. Um, and I've never thought about that until you said it. It's like, oh, aha moment, yeah. Yeah, and, and I use the word centered because, you know, be, people understand, you know, someone like the Dalai Lama, he's a great example I, I love to use. He gets up and every day he spends a couple of hours meditating to get back to the point where he can be balanced and deal with whatever's going on. Mm. He's somebody that was a leader of a country that no longer exists, of a people that are persecuted, all of these different, like we are talking about, all these different factors outside of him that mean that he could be very sad or upset or this or that. And he spends that time and that discipline, that's why he's so loved and well-regarded, he's got that discipline to bring him back to his, his balance and his self-centeredness and again, you know, people might say, well, this or that is happening. Why are you being so selfish or self-centered and meditating for two hours instead of supporting X, Y, and Z? And, and it's because he spends that time that he can support what he does and be like that guiding light in that way because of his um, habits that he has developed to be selfish and self-centered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my mentors, uh, Robin Sharma, he wrote a book called The 5am Club. It's, it's quite a new book to me. I only heard about it about six months ago. Um, but in it, he talks about the importance of having uh, time for yourself. Um, and, you know, 5am Club is five till six. Um, and in that time, there's exercise and uh, reflection and also learning. Um, and he talks about it from the angle of all of the biochemical changes that happen. So when you exercise, there's lots of uh, serotonin and dopamine that is produced. And then that kind of compounds with the um, when you're reflecting. So whether that's meditation or, or journaling or something that compounds as well, you get more clarity. And then when you're learning something uh, in that last 20 minute section, you're so receptive to the information that you've taken in. And, and so, you know, it's a really great place to start your day from. So he calls it the victory hour, um, which sounds a little bit corny, but actually I find that it's the most productive. Uh, those are the most productive days that I have when I've taken that time out for myself. And it's really interesting that, you know, it's only 20 minutes of each of those things, um, but it has such a profound effect, I guess, because it builds on itself. Uh, but I, I love it and I love sharing it because it's just one of the really easy ways that you can carve out that time for yourself and be self-centered. And, and and I love it. And I have heard of the 5am club. Um, I actually belong to it and every now and then do post a photo of the sunrise and stuff. So it's quite beautiful to be part of that community. And um, the focus where, um, and that's a great example again, where, um, it's not about being selfish towards, it's nothing about anybody outside of the situation, that everything you're talking about and that um, he talks about is activities and habits to do for you. So I think the great examples, again, of where it's um, that focus on you, but it's not like you're running away from the world or from this or that. And, and they're also great insights and tips for uh, or suggestions for how people, whether it's, you know, 5 a.m., you could, you could call it the 7 a.m. club or the 10 a.m. club, <laughs> the, time, the time is irrelevant. Um, for some people, you know, it could be the midnight club. <laughs> That's for their style or, or um, it's easier for them to do that at night, you know, once the kids are in bed or something, um, to spend that time then just in the quiet with themselves and that thinking. And I, I love when people talk about the... Um, the great resignation and all those other things at the moment because I wonder how much we've been um, locked away in some sense because of this or that or whatever and, and not having as many opportunities to travel and to socialise that that in a sense has actually created some of these self-recovering, if you like, of what is more meaningful to them in their lives. Yes, I actually also don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing. Now, I'm not, I'm not on the other side of the, of the great resignation, um, but I do think that it's come as a result of people realising what's important to them um, and working yourself into the grave is a bit of a, you know, it's not the best way to live your life, really. So I think people are striving for more work-life balance. That's how I read what's happening with the great resignation. 
Yeah, that I think, and also there's people like yourselves, you know, as, as we have an ageing population around the world, and as they are starting to look at their children and grandchildren and wonder if there'll be a planet for them to sit in when they're 90 years old watching the grandchildren, mm. um, I think that that also has affected um, the, the sense of values around different things, you know, how, how many houses can you own or how many millions can you have in the bank and, and it's still slow and, and this is of course where the, the changes in the planet versus the changes in people's mindsets and is something that we have to keep watching yeah absolutely and you know we, we it's easy to get caught up in the doom and gloom but actually i'm quite excited to be alive at this stage because i figure we've got nothing to lose anyway like i can give this my all um, and if if we do nothing, then we're in a sucky situation. Um, so why not just go all out and and try and turn it around? And I really do think that it is that collective belief system. And as soon as we shift that, um, then we will be able to turn it around because all of these, like all of our creative energy, will be unleashed. We'll come up with these amazing solutions and go, hey, yeah, right, we've got this. So. I think that for me, I mean, there's been a few key times in my life where I've seen, I've really seen people power in action. And um, there was one time uh, there was a, a, a coal seam gas mining um, that was coming to our local area, not so local to me, maybe about an hour's drive away, um, but beautiful rural farmland. And, and um, you know, I, I don't know if you know much about coal seam gas, but it really litters the landscape and the water tables are affected and in some places even like flames coming out of the taps so I, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field but it just for me it didn't make sense to give up all of this wonderful productive farmland uh, for coal seam gas um, so there's quite a, a big sort of campaign around it and it culminated in many people I think I think maybe two three thousand people um, basically uh, in this area the, the whole campaign was based around an organization called lock the gate so it's basically saying no to the coal seam gas companies and all of these people descended on uh, the site next door to where the coal seam gas mining was about to start and um, it, it, it went on for weeks um, you know people just really camping out there I, I was um, my second child was really small at that point so I came and went but it was just this wonderful sense of community and the the so the, the last thing that happened was that the riot police were going to come down and 800 riot police were due to come to this site the world's attention was on what was happening because it was a really big deal and the new south wales government they ended up buying the license off the company that had the the license and um so a crisis was averted and so that for me was a really powerful thing of well you know the power of community to come together to say, well, actually, no, we don't want this to happen. And, and you know, and, and there were all sorts of doom and gloom scenarios. It was like, it could have been absolute carnage, um, but it was a really high vibration. Like there was singing, there was dancing, there was, it was people from like farmers and hippies and, and, you know, like, and you didn't have to be a farmer or a hippie. You could have been anybody, like any cross section <laughs> of the community, indigenous elders, like it was, and it was just so beautiful how everybody got on because we were all there um, to do something amazing to prevent uh, this happening. So uh, that that was that's really defined the trajectory of my life for me. Um, I can really see the, the power of people when they come together for a common good. And that's why I just won't give up on humanity because I know that we've got this in us, we're hardwired to help. Um, and yeah, I believe we can turn it around. And that's such a, Fabulous, fabulous way to quickly go into how can people, if they want to speak with you some more, get hold of you after today, Dion? Yeah, cool. I can't believe it's gone that fast. <laughs> 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 well, I am on LinkedIn. So if they do a search for me on LinkedIn, it's it's Dion Payne, D-I-O-N-N-E, Payne, P-A-Y-N. So they can search for me on LinkedIn. They'll find me there. Um, they'll see the articles I've written um that i've got a book uh, called ethical property investing which I, I do say so myself is a really good read i love it <laughs> and um I, and, and the reception that i've got from um the broader communities that they love it too so it's really about sharing you know 
again sharing that, that vision yeah yeah fabulous and and i love this question and um i'm, I'm so fascinated to hear your answer if you would give yourself your younger self some advice what would that advice be stand your ground like know what it is that you want um and when you've made that decision just stand your ground because everything will move to where it needs to be for you to be able to manifest that vision. Fabulous. What profound and, and what a very, very deep um, conversation today. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Dion Payne, for being the guest today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been so wonderful and such um, fabulous, fabulous topics. And uh, I think I've used fabulous about 20 times today because <laughs> it's been so wonderful. <laughs> so thank you very much for taking the time today and to the viewers thank you again for watching and for supporting the show and it's because of you that I keep so motivated and so excited about pe bringing fabulous people like Dr Dion Payne onto the show but for now from my heart to your heart be great be fabulous and be you <laughs>